and welcome back to the CCNA journey with me, Ryan. And in this section, we're going to look at IPv4 addressing and binary. So this is a snippet from the CSEN, and ultimately it gives us the introduction to an IPv4, the protocol itself, and how it's connectionless and best effort, and the 32-bit addressing scheme. And then we look at binary and understanding how we can convert from decimal to binary and binary to decimal. So these are very fundamental things that we need to make sure that we're happy with because they're tested quite heavily throughout Cisco's certification track. So for those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. So in this video, we're gonna have a look at the IPv4 addressing. So we're gonna understand it's a 32-bit address, four bytes, uh, it's connectionless, it's unreliable, and it's best effort. So it's important that you understand what those terminology actually mean when describing the IP protocol. And understanding IP is obviously version four, and there's of course version six, which you may or may not have heard of, um, and that will be in the video series also. But for now, IPv4 is something we wanna cover in this lesson. And then the last part of the lesson, and this is really important too, is to make sure that you can convert from decimal to binary and binary to decimal. So practice, 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 because once you understand that conversion, there's lots of things in the world of networking that re relies on you to understand that conversion. So nail it now, make sure you understand it at the CCNA and your journey will be a lot easier. In the next couple of videos, we'll dive into subnetting in a bit more detail. And then we'll jump into things like VLANs and setting up the network. So let's get started. Watch these videos. Oh, and make sure you like and subscribe if you find them useful. Cheers. Okay, so what do we need to know about IPv4 moving forward? The first thing is it's a 32-bit addressing system. So you can see here that when we mean 32-bit addressing system, we mean 32s, 1s, and zeros. So this here represents an IP address in binary format. However, we normally display them in what we refer to as dotted decimal, which is displayed in this format. Now the 32 bits are split into what's called four octets. So you can see here, each dot breaks up the IP address into a single octet. So there's one, two, three, four octets in total. Within each octet, there are eight bits. Eight bits equal one byte. So that's one byte here, and another byte, another byte, another byte. So that's four bytes in total. And then four times eight is essentially 32. So we know there's 32 bits, but instead of calling them bytes, we tend to refer to them as octets. So there are four octets, each octet considering eight bits, four times eight is 32. So in total, there's 32 bits. It's represented with binary as far as our PC is concerned, but we as humans see it and translate it into a dotted decimal format. Okay, so moving on. Each byte is eight bits. We call it an octet. We know this. It can be anything from zero to 255. So essentially this means that if we think about our IP addressing, it could be anything from 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 up to 255, 255, and two more 255s. Okay, so each octet can be a zero or it can be a 255. We also consider IP as a protocol in itself a best effort, connectionless, and unreliable. So you may be wondering at this point, hang on, if the internet uses IP, how do we have any form of reliability across the networks today? And the reason is, because when we are talking about networking as a whole, we talk about reliability provided by upper layers. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say we had um, a particular host that connected to a routing segment, which connected to another router, and on the back of that, another host. Well, when the packets, we call them packets because we're talking about layer three of the OSI model. Remember, we call layer three of the OSI model packets. As the packets are leaving the router, let's say when it gets this particular router, the buffer on the router is too full to accept a particular packet. So the packet essentially gets dropped. Now, IPv4 responsibility is not to let the originating host know that the packet was initially dropped because it's not part of IPv4. 
IP will essentially allow that packet to be dropped for one reason or another. And what we, what we would rely on essentially is when the rest of the packets reach the destination PC and the destination in PC pushes it up to the upper layer protocol, in this case, TCP, the transmission control protocol at layer four, where it starts to use all these packets to rebuild these segments. Remember we used to call the segments layer four. When you use these packets to build the segments, you realize that it's unable to uh, complete building that segment because some of the packets were not correctly received because this particular packet was dropped. So TCP doesn't know where or how it dropped, but all TCP knows is I didn't receive all the packets I need to rebuild this segment. So what happens is this particular host here will ask this particular host up here to retransmit that packet. Hopefully that packet reaches the destination and in turn, the segment is able to be reconstructed and TCP is then able to pass it to the application that needs that information. So when we think about IP as a protocol in itself, we consider it best effort, connectionless and unreliable. But in order to have that reliability, we rely on the upper layer protocols to provide it. So when we say best effort, we mean IP um, essentially does its best to ensure that the packets are not dropped, but there's no way in actually ensuring through IP in itself that the packets are delivered. We say IP is connectionless, which means each packet is treated independently from all the others. So there's no sequencing sent from one computer and there's no guaranteed dedicated path that one will take. So one, pack, uh, one uh, packet might take a different path to another packet. And we also say it's unreliable. So we don't deliver the guarantee. The packet may be lost, it may be duplicated, or it may be delayed or delivered out of order. And that's where TCP comes back in to ensure that the delivery is successful and all the packets are received so it can be rebuilt back into that segment. Okay, so the last point to pick up is what is an IP address actually used for? And it's used to represent you as an individual on the network. So for example, if we had, let's say, uh, three PCs, each PC connected to let's say a particular network, which was split up by a couple of routers. And there was a PC over in the distance that needed to communicate with you. It would identify your network portion of the IP address to find which network you live on. And then it will use the host portion of the IP address to identify which PC or device you are inside that network. And later on, when we understand routing in more detail and how an IP address calculates the host and network portion, it would become a bit more clear. But essentially an IP is normally a unique value that is assigned to you as an individual that allows other people to uh, route towards in order to find you. Okay, so it's almost like uh, your house address, for example, if you think about your street that you live in, your street would be your network and what house you are on that street is considered your host part. On to our next section, we're gonna have a discussion around binary. Now, we said binary essentially is what our PCs see, whereas we would see it as a decimal. So you can see here, I've got a decimal value, which is an IP address. It's split by the four octets. And then you can see beside it, there's 32 bits, which is how our PCs or networking devices would interpret this IP address. So binary is a numbering scheme which allows only two possible values to exist, which is zero and one. The values are sometimes referred to as low and high or off and on. And because there's only two values, but in decimal we have up to 10 values, zero to nine, we need a way to essentially put the zero to nine values, if you like, into only a possibility of two values. And to do that, we need some sort of conversion table. And to create that conversion table, what we're going to do is something very simple. We're actually going to start with the number one and we're going to double the number each time. So one doubled is two, two doubled is four, four doubled is eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Now we'll notice what else I've done here is I've only done it eight times. So one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight. Now I can go higher. In fact, I can go nine, which would be 256, 10, which would be 512, then you've got 1024, 2048, and all I'm doing is doubling the previous number. But because we're dealing with eight bits, or in this case, an octet, also referred to as a byte, we're only going to do it eight times. So we're going to do it eight placements. Now we have this conversion table together. We're going to use the conversion table to essentially put the decimal numbers into this table to identify where those decimal numbers sit. So, for example, the first number we have is 192. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the number 192 and we're going to ask ourselves, does 128 fit into 192? If the answer is yes, we're going to give it a 1. If the answer is no, we're going to give it a 0. In this case, 128 does fit into 192, so we're going to give it a 1. But what we've also done is we've used 128 now. So we're going to get a 192 number and we're going to take away 128 and that will leave us with 64. Because we've not yet reached 0, we're going to continue. So the next one would be 64. And the question is, does 64 fit into 64? The answer again is yes. So we're going to put a, put a 1 there. So we take 64 and we take away 64 again. Obviously that's 0. So because that's 0, all the others would in fact now become 0. Because there is no value left. There is no decimal numbers to to put anywhere. So pretty straightforward. Now for the next number, which is 168, we're going to do the same again. The first question we need to ask ourselves is can 128 fit into 168? The answer is yes it can. If we then get 168 and we take away 128, we're left with 40. Does 64 fit in 40? The answer is no. Does 32 fit into 40? The answer is yes. And if we were to take away 32, we'd be left with 8. Can 16 go into 8? The answer is no. Can 8 go into 8? The answer is yes. And then we're left with all zeros at the end. So the outcome would be 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Now the next one is going to be even easier, which is a 0. So because this is zero, they're all going to be zero. And the one on the end is all going to be zeros apart from the one here. So you're left with just the one and all of these bits are turned off. And all of these bits are turned off because it's zero. And here we've turned on the 128, we've turned on 32, and we've turned on the eight. If you add them all up together, it equals 168. Here we've turned on the 128, we've turned on the 64, if you add them both together, leaving all the others off, it equals 192. So, so that's how you calculate essentially a decimal number into binary, but how do you do binary into decimal? And the way we do that, let's say we get given a number, let's say it's 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we get asked what is the decimal number that this binary value represents, what we can do is to simply place a 1 under the ones that are actually turned on. So we're going to turn on a 1, we're going to not turn on 2, not turn on 4, but we are going to turn on 8, we're not going to turn on 16, but we are going to turn on 32, 64, and 128. All we have to do now is add up the numbers that are initially turned on. So we've got to add 128 to 64, and then we've got to add 32 to that. So that would be 128 plus 64, which is 192. And then we're going to plus 32, which is 224. Then we're going to plus 8, which is 232. And then we're going to plus 1, which is 233. So we know that the answer to this is actually 233. So the trick, essentially, to do anything between binary to decimal and decimal to binary is to understand about this conversion table and then utilizing this conversion table we're able to 
move any number from decimal to binary and from binary to decimal. Okay, so that's all we've got time for in this lesson. Just wanted to recap what we've done. So we first of all talked about IPv4. We said that this was a 32-bit addressing scheme, which consists of four bytes. And we understood that it was an unreliable and best effort protocol, meaning that the IP protocol itself at layer three doesn't do anything to ensure that the traffic is actually uh, reliable and gets to its final destination. It kind of is connectionless and works on a hop by hop basis. What we do to ensure that traffic is there successfully is we use upper layer protocols at layer four, like TCP, which gives us that reliability, or UDP, which gives us no reliability, but it does give us the speed, which we obviously know from the previous videos we've discussed about the uh, layer four protocols. And then we finish up the video by ensuring that we understood binary. And the key thing being is that you need to be able to go away and understand how you can convert from binary to decimal and from decimal to binary. Because no doubt, a very simple and quick question that you know any exam is going to ask you really is they're going to throw up you know, a bunch of uh, binary and ask you what is the decimal output of that? Is it A, B, C? And you're going to have to quickly look at this in your head, work out what the number is and tick the right option. So it's important that you know how to do that. And lastly, I put here, play the game. Have a quick Google. There are plenty of binary games out there which allows you to brush up on your decimal to binary skills. Because obviously, just like anything, if you don't use it, you lose it. So go have a play and make sure you're happy prior to taking the exam. So I hope this video has been informative. I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.